Good evening, every good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Good Times Hour. All right, B, take it away. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world, please stand and deliver your finest ovation for our next special guest. She's the MVP from the MVC, the softball queen who always stands tall and has been the master of the fairways and greens since the fall of the new millennium ball. She's always been in a league of her own, Iowa grown and Texas bound, big in town and on her own playground. She's the elderberry of the wildflower tour, the merry sprite with titanic power and razor sharp focus that has dominated and impressed and inspired us. She's the new mint goat, the chief wrangler of the sparkle pony boys and the rock lobster toys. And her motto in life has always been when in doubt twirl fish and birdie through deserts and grottoes. She's the eternal free tale with a sublime mind and a spirit like a joyous sail. She drives a taco truck with skill, dedication and some luck. She's the fearless competitor and relentless educator, a veritable terminator and awe-inspiring dominator. Assembled host of Worthies, please welcome to the tea, the Wizard of Wimberley and a true goat, Des, purple and gold, never old, Redding. Oh, oh my goodness, that was the best <laughs> ever, and you have done so many good ones. Ah, thank you, thank really, you. that's great. Oh. <laughs> He digs so deep. over, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Did he cover it all? Yeah. <laughs> plenty and plenty of Easter eggs in that thing, for sure. Oh, my goodness. I can't wait to hear it on the repeat. Oh, <laughs> I, got a, I got two tears. Nice. That's good. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I mean, B's, B's really good at that. His, his research and his uh, word smithery is pretty unsurpassed. Completely just, just there. So, yeah, I love um, oh, we're going to jump right in and uh, start with what we call the framework. Um, one thing at the top of the list would be that your PDJ number is 15863, making you one step cooler, as you put it earlier today, <laughs> than your husband. Oh, <laughs> it is true. I was in first. <laughs> Thanks, Brian but, Hennigan. <laughs> there you go so um so yeah one five eight six three this is going to come up again um so i'm going to run through a few things and we can stop and talk about it a little bit and then we can keep on going because there's there's a little bit of information to cover here there's a lot so um you have three women's world championships in the open division in o two o five o six correct correct does one of those stand out more than the others the well really i mean everyone always says straight up the first because it's so true i can remember we were all kind of camped out in a the it might have been the holiday inn in tom bass there near tom bass at houston and it was oh, yeah. Spirit, cam todd you were probably in there but i remember cam todd particularly he said and oh because he was the 2001 champion he would have been the year before yeah correct um he's like someone in here is going to be a world champion that day you know, at the end of this week. And so, you know, we all got our electrics going. And then I was pretty much flawless, you know, for being a rookie and getting named rookie of the year. And I can remember in the ninth round, I think we played nine rounds back then, missing, missing a putt, you know, and I hadn't missed a putt until almost that ninth round at the end. And, you know, it was, it just snapped me to the point. It was like, oh my gosh, you, you've played so good. You're going to win it. You know, like you just you really so it took it till the ninth round. The ninth round, that's when it really hits you. That's interesting, you know, because it's <clears throat> obviously what is it, four rounds, five rounds now, or five and a half rounds now. And it just doesn't five, seem yep. um, I mean, I'm I know that they're all happy with it, but I, I everybody we talk to who ever did well in the world is like going, but they're not playing as much as we did, you know. I mean, it's it's that's one recurring thing. And then another recurring thing is I could have had a lower number if I'd have got it when my friends did. I mean, we've heard that from almost everybody that's been on the show. And I it's going to carry on. Story. Absolutely. Right? You know, yep. and, and like we're going to hear one from somebody with a two digit number later on this year. He's going to tell that same story. So this it's it's <laughs> um it's really interesting, though, that, you know, like you didn't like nine rounds. That's a long time. It is and a long time. And, and I don't think everybody has their head wrapped around how long it is. And man, you know, I, I'll that's say two this. rounds a day. I have a whole lot more fun at worlds now that I don't play worlds. <laughs> 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 I have a blast at worlds. It was like, if that, I wish I could have stayed more than two days last week, but, or two weeks ago in Flagstaff, but 
it's tons of fun when you're not playing because there's it's just so many special. people so many people you can see so many hugs to collect so many stories to tell so um you I also think that, huh? that, I let me say that quickly on that nine rounds too. I think it really shaped a lot of my framework of how to actually compete also because I was in a deficit after the first round and I, I did not do any stats on myself to you know know what it was. But you know, I can remember being anywhere five, from five to six strokes, and there were so many rounds that I was thinking, I was like, well, if you just mathematically break this down, I only have to make up one stroke around, you know. And so it just appeared to be so easy mm -hmm. then when you just kind of like broke games down like that, and then as yeah tournaments got shorter and shorter in the durations of your rounds, you could actually apply that to holes, you know? So it really did just really quickly shape. And that was a lot of my athletic background too, of being very yeah. disciplined and skill sets and how you analytically look at things. But um, well, it definitely that, had a great influence. And that totally makes sense. And, 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 you know, it's easy to spread that pressure out over five rounds as opposed to, you know, when you're playing, you know, when you're playing five rounds total, then, then you're only looking at, you know, you oh well, I've only got two more rounds to figure this out. You know, or I've only got three more rounds to get this going, and 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 I better get going soon. And then that pressure is a whole lot harder to deal with. I would think. I don't it really have a lot of experience the, in that department, but it I mean, puts it the pressure so much more on that first round. Like you, you cannot tank that first. You round. You can't win it the first round, but you can certainly lose it the first round. That's it. I know a little bit about certainly that. Certainly, playing a nine nine plus round tournament. Uh, you, with your patient experience in breaking down videotape, yes, yes, VHS videotape, all day, and you know, working the machines and studying your forms, studying the opponents for the weaknesses, studying your own self for your strengths. That kind of patience helps look at nine rounds as like, well, this is nothing. We've already spent all this time, and and as you as you're talking about breaking down from from days to rounds to individual holes that helps just you know the scientific and empirical approach the whole idea of a daunting challenge ahead of you all day I, huge success. I, I love disc golf but i definitely came into disc golf com as a competitor you know it was very recreational to start with but um i was a complete competitor and i took it seriously from day one yeah. well and you know another thing too that you were talking about there paul with the um with the uh Oh, geez, I just drew a blank on what I was going to say, because I was thinking about what you just said about about being a competitor the whole time. Um, now let's carry let's on. Get, let's get back to a competitive I'll come career. back We've to it. Lots of plaudits to get through here. All right. So um, adding to the uh, the pro world championships, you have a master's world championship and you have two, two three U.S. women's championships. Oh two, oh three, oh four, and then you have U.S. Women's Masters Championships in twelve and thirteen. So that's really um, that's a whole nother stack between those three. I mean, that's a huge amount of accomplishment there. And then this other stat that we talked about briefly right before the show, which is probably well, I know I don't want to diminish any of the other great stats that you have, but this might be the most impressive stat that you have, and that's eighty six straight podiums between July 2nd and 3rd, 2005, the Michiana Open and the KC Wide Open on June 6th through the 8th in 2008. You were on the podium every one of those tournaments, 86 in a row. You missed it in the Japan Open with a fourth place finish, which is not anything to balk at. I'm sure that was a huge field. I didn't actually- 150 look at class. Yeah, well, and then there's that. <laughs> And then, but then for that, for that whole entire year, that was your only miss on the podium, oh, wow. you know? So, I mean, beyond the 86, you finished, you, out. <laughs> you finished out from what, like late May or is it, I don't know if it was May or June that year, but like when I went, I think it was in June. But yeah. Monsoon. Yeah. yeah whenever okay. it's raining, come on over. <laughs> but that's, that's one of those fairly untouchable stats that's, you know, we leave it to the stat mando and other stat junkies out there to comb through the archives and records. But that right there is worthy of alone. Just that alone is worthy of entry into the hall of fame, let alone everything else that you've done. But thank, mm. Thanks for digging that one up. Um, 
yeah, that's 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 really big. I mean, I remember that period of time just being completely in groove with my game. We were Jay and I were juggling a lot. I mean, we were helping with the National Tour Clinic Series. We were running our own clinic series. We were repping for Innova, um, doing store appearances and store checkups for sales because you know disc golf was just at that state of time. We were all working on ground levels, boots on the ground to try to facilitate the growth growth of it, um, and. Yeah, I can completely remember just being so kind of like overworked, but in tune, you know, you kind of just are kind of like a oiled machine at that point in time going from point A to point B. We always still had fun day Monday to go on and um, God, I am really, really proud of it because of even in 07, I won every national tour that I entered. I think I was nine for nine, eight of eight. It was somewhere around there, eight of eight or nine of nine. So I won every single one that I was entered. Um, yeah. Stat Mando did do a stat on podium finishes at one point, and I did uh, PM him or down message him um, that I was like, man, I feel like I have a lot of them. So thanks for pointing that out to actually had a lot. His was a slightly different stat than the one that you put out. Um, his started at the beginning of the career where mine is in the middle of the career, but um, both well, what and did and what I have done are both completely like phenomenal on dominance of the game. Well, and that's, you know, and that, that carries, uh, carries amount of, uh, carries a fair amount of more than a fair amount of merit and no matter what time of your career it took place. I mean, that's a huge streak, you know, I mean, 86, yeah. that's, you know, I mean, that's as significant as, you know, when, when did the champ break his streak? You know, it was when McBeth shot a 52 during the same round on the same card and oh, he wow. just missed the cash at USDGC. And, and, you know, and it was, and, and that's, that's significant that, that matters, you know, it, it's, I mean, that's very significant on your part. I mean, 86, that's just amazing. Thank you. Thank you. We're only, and we're only like one, two, three, four, five, six, no, five, you know, five lines in. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the, uh, in two, in O two, O six and O seven, you were mixed doubles world champions. Uh, can, I, can I just I, confirm they were all with Yeti? All day, every day. I actually, I do feel like we are the only married couple to do all the like. That's a that I don't, might I, be possible. Yeah, I, well, probably the winningness. I'm going to say there's probably other married couples that have played and won. That's a hard fact to know. With mm. that's a real hard stat to find with the PDJ, the World Mixed Doubles. Well, uh, I'll I'll go out on a limb. I was thinking about this today when I was driving around, and like I think that. I think that you're probably the happiest wife of any of the married couples I know in the, in the, in the game. I mean, like, I never see you not smiling. I mean, I don't remember. I only remember a couple of times you ever getting mad in my presence. I'm not saying it never happens. That's you good. Know, I but, hide it. But <laughs> I, only remember, I remember a couple of times and I don't even remember the specifics. I think I might've tried to block it because it was so rare. And I was like, Whoa, shit. I didn't see that. I'm, I'm going over here, you know, but, <laughs> But it's, I do remember, I mean, I, I really think that most of the times I ever see you, like I've looked at some photos today and, and chose the one with you by the, with the beer in the basket and to post up with the, with the, uh, the link to the show. And I was just like looking at us going, man, look at, she's smiling in all these pictures, you know? And I was just, I don't remember a time unless you're like on the tee pad delivering a drive or something like that. I mean, like you're hanging out, you're smiling, you know? And Hey, Good thanks thing. for saying that because I do it, hated that and I still hate that that classic when you're actually playing the tournament and a dude or someone will come up to you and you know it has to be a dude it could be a woman too and be like why aren't you smiling well I'm not smiling because I'm competing you know like people don't really smile when they compete unless they're kicking ass and dominating and, and they're you know, in an 86 <laughs> street yeah. 86 straight podium streak you know, something like that <laughs> uh, but life's good to smile man I always wanted to be stardust so I try to live it if you want to be it, you better live it. Man, right. That's awesome. So O2, you were co-rookie of the year. Do you remember who that was with? Because oh, Barrett White and to oh, this one of my greatest friends. He's I one mean, of the coolest people on the planet. And nobody has more her. skills than Barrett. I mean, seriously. She might actually, between her and Elaine, have the most wins. It's really close. It was battling back and forth. Uh, Barrett really? just smashes. We should look her up. I mean, she is an incredible. Um, you should. Yeah, bring well, we're going to get her. Sour. Yeah, absolutely. She's definitely one of the people that I want to have on the list. I just haven't had a chance to talk to her in a long time. Although, yeah. smart as a win and phenomenal skills on the course. Well, and she won't, there's not probably a time that she won't die for a frisbee either. I mean, no. She's definitely going to be one of the most fun people that you 
that you're around if you if you run into her at a tournament you better just start hanging out with her because the fun's coming her way for sure yeah, yeah she is part of the, the original team p crew i mean we are we're as tight as tight and thick as thieves so i love her it yeah, couldn't be so awesome. with a better person yeah that's the only thing you know the only thing I, like, I don't like about her is she doesn't live anywhere near us so, so i haven't run into her forever we were both she was in illinois and i was iowa so we were actually head to head battling all the time for that rookie of the year and so you know pretty intense you know when it came down to it we were curious of like gosh i wonder how they're going to settle this and we ended up tied because it was a really close battle between the two of us um in the end barrett might even like get the slight edge if i was to tell the story of she was such a maniac back then to get her game better. She would do push-ups or sit-ups every time she would bogey a hole. Well, it kind of gets to be a wheel in the end, you know, she got fit and she's definitely fit in her old age, probably because of all those push-ups and sit-ups she did, but she gave me some strokes back in the day by tiring <laughs> herself out. <laughs> oh, okay. That makes total sense. Uh, so. That makes total sense. All right. So, 04, you were the PDGA Edge, you got the PDGA Edge Award. And I don't even know what the PDJ Edge Award is personally. So go ahead and enlighten me on that a little bit. Um, when Edge was created in 2002 to 2003, we partnered in the PDJ partnered with Edge to create an award that uh, helps acknowledge and award ex excellence in education. And so with Edge being one of the four founding, you know, premier standard base that really what set us apart from some of the precursors with Stancil Johnson, Andy Lehman, um, Stork had a, a guidebook out, um, but EDGE itself was a standard based curriculum. And so that put us right into the Library of Congress, right with working with um, schools and the PDGA saw that worth as a way to expand their growth. And so we together created the award of excellence and we try to across the board, we try to keep it within the PDGA because you know it's good to foster members, but it does branch out outside of the PDJ and um, some of those members that we have awarded outside of the PJ have now joined the PDJ. Um, and Was that what Rob got last year in Rock Hill then? That's correct. Yep. Okay. All right. Cool. Awesome. I didn't. I, so I do know a little bit about it. I just, well, you know, yeah. sometimes there's a lapse. Well, it's it's a weird anytime with the PDJ and those awards, they always come out a year late and sometimes they get buried. Um, if it's not the player of the year, it's, you know, they're hard to come by. Right on. Right on. All right. So speaking of player of the year or speaking of the year, player of the year, 02, 04, 06, oh, excuse me, 05 and 06. And then in 07, you got the Steady Ed Spirit of the Game trophy. And you also won Players Cup champ in 07 as well. During the streak. During the streak. 07 was my best year straight up with all the national tour wins, never lost, won a major um you know i just i didn't win worlds basically but i won a major i mean 07 was my by far my best year and i would put it up against a lot of other pros years i mean it's yeah, one of the so, top five excellence so and the reason this the reason we came onto this was because in 06 and 07 both you were you were straight in both of those two years but then it overlapped back in 05 and it will overlap forward in 08 so just so everybody at home knows that you know, two straight years plus a half a year in either direction. So in a True. sense, it was nearly three years. You know, in I mean, the, actually, the player of the it year was, was three years. And the player of the year has its, you know, it's been it's been changed since my um, that 07 Valerie Val Jenkins was awarded the player of the year. At that time, the PDGA had as a popularity vote. Um, so every, I can't say it's a popularity vote. Um, it was a player's choice, you know, and so in the end, players just voted for who they wanted to play with. Sometimes, you know, in this case, I, disc golfers did not vote according to the way the stats were laid out. And so Val won that. Um, I did write into the PDJ and we had the award change. So it's based on a statistical analysis. It went through a couple different um, iterations with that. I think um, it was a little too top heavy on the players rating at that point in time and so you know players worked with it to kind of like shape the players award um so yeah from those first ones where i had those in caps i had some really good years and i think i deserved the player of the year but it just wasn't awarded that but you know since now it's been changed and that's where we are at hence the good times hour you know that's what we've done we've all kind of helped shaped the organization yeah. better. Laid the groundwork in so many different ways yeah. and i can remember 
um, when Julianne and I were tied in the O2 to the what was the O3 worlds um, or player of the year. I actually voted for Juliana. Um, we were both equal in the amount of wins. She won worlds. I won US women's. I waited worlds more. And, you know, Juliana won that one, you know, and that's just one yeah. vote, you know, in the end. And who knows, you know, and I did a statistic. That's probably pretty fair too at the time. I mean, worlds probably did carry a little bit more weight than US women's, but now I, I mean, still I'm, does. Yeah. Does it? Oh, yeah. Everyone wants to be a world champion. What Cam Top say back then? Once you're a world champion, you're always a world champion. That's twice you've quoted him tonight. Well, I'm only going to, it's the same quote. So, Cam, <laughs> <eat me. laughs> two for one. And we always love a special here on the Good Times Hour. All right. So, these three are kind of, here's three more things that kind of go together. In 13, 2013, you were inducted into the Iowa Disc Golf Hall of Fame with Jason Steffen, Scott Inez, and Kim Steele. And I don't know Kim, but I know both of those other guys. And that's pretty, that's pretty solid company right there, without a doubt. Um, then, I'm, I'm the freshie on that group, that's for sure. Yeah, I without got, a doubt. Yep. Without a doubt. And then in 14, you got the Bob West Memorial Sportsmanship Award. And then in 17, you were inducted into the PDJ Hall of Fame with Brian Graham and John Bird. Um, and you were the first. Here's the next time your number comes up. We were the first five-digit um, number into the Hall of Fame. So that's yeah. really cool too. So those are three good things to talk about all at the same time, in, in my opinion. Well, let's just, let's just add it's like a Hall one. of Fame book in, or it's a Hall of Fame bread on the Bob West Memorial sandwich. Well, just yeah. add one one more one more slice to the bottom of the of the sandwich there. 2018 inductee into the Texas Disc Golf Hall of Fame as well. Oh yeah, you know what? I didn't even look at that because there was the a... Halls of Fame. Obviously, Iowa was the first one to recognize, but. As May said, that's a that's a hell of a sandwich right there in terms of commemoration and really due praise and recognition. It it does feel um, it just it, it feels like everything has been worth it and validated. You know, I think uh, it, you know purses are big nowadays. There are lots of good things that are going on in the disc golf realm. Um, it makes me so satisfied to be part of it and have a groundwork with it and then also be able to be recognized. And so, you know, I, I do hope our, I love what you're doing right here because I think it's so important to have our sport really recognize the historical figures that have come um, before all of this stuff that's gonna just boom disc golf, you know? So For sure. it's cool to be the, the, you know, the Greg Normans and stuff that can come onto the course. And it's only if we talk about it and really look at those facts. And, and I don't think a lot of us with the forward, fast forward social media, that's always in your face, in your face, people don't peel those layers away enough to actually look at them. Um, well, and with so much on the surface, there's not necessarily a reason to look any deeper because there's so much on the surface, you know? Well, so, okay. Like I want to, I'm going to let a cat out of the bag right now because, um, this is something that's really cool that happened in Flagstaff and um, and it's going to address uh, what I've said and, and, and called an issue oh, of, <laughs> of ours. Oh my <laughs> like we've, been, we've been like the sport in the sense of that it's been we've been a little bit lady light in, in terms of our guests. But um, one of the reasons I wanted to go to Flagstaff was because I wanted to track down Tita Ugaldi and I didn't have her contact information. So. I ran into her at the banquet and I asked her, you know, Hey, would you, would you like, would you be interested in being on our show? Uh, I'm not sure when it would work out for you, but we would certainly love to have you on. And she said, Hey, will you come out into the hallway with me? And this was the same room where the meeting was. Right. So it's kind of clap, kind of noisy and whatnot. Um, I think y'all were probably in there, but I'm not sure, but that was on Tuesday night. So she asked me to come out into the hallway and she said, Hey, we're having to get together on September 20th at the U S women's championship. And it's going to be all of the women that are under or that are three digit, two digit or one digit PDJ members. <laughs> so that's like an aside event from U.S. Women's. And she said, would you be interested in coming and interviewing us for that? And I was like, are you kidding me? Of course, we'd be interested. So um, we don't haven't worked out the logistics yet, but um, we're definitely going to be involved in that. Paul won't be on site yet, but um, we're going to we're going to actually be I already was planning on being at the beach that week anyway so we're cutting the beach week short and we're going to Burlington and 
it probably won't just be on the September 20th because I can't imagine we'll get it all done that day. I but, hope they will to the, the public. I mean, what a create, it really does seem like it should be almost like a, not an open forum, but we should be, I would love to sit in, you know? Well, cool. and I would, I, well, so and that's, and so like, here's the deal. This has only been one, we're only one discussion into it. And I'm, uh, I mean, like, we're going to have to, like, Paul and I aren't going to know any of these people hardly. So we're going to have to get in some phone conversations with all of them and, 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 you know, just get to know them a little bit and dig some information up too. And then do a lot of research before we get there. But yeah, I would, I don't know why it would, I mean, I would think that that would be an inclusive event because they would want everybody else to hear this too. So I don't know, that's, this is still in the works, but this is going to happen in September for sure. So Oh, steady, Ed. Yeah, look at that 965 playing on the men's courses. Yeah, yeah. We just kind of breezed nice. through this, but, but that's an important trophy to win too, isn't it? Oh my gosh, that one of all the national tours at De La Vega was like the monkey off my back. You know that Steely Down song, you know, like, yeah, monkey, holy moly. was so happy to win that one finally. Yeah, that's a good win. <laughs> that's a tough win too. I mean, there's so oh. many, so many, well, I mean, how, was that the same year that you got Poison Oak out there? Oh, who knows? I can remember losing one year at that course, um, putting, and you know, and those baskets were always really thin back in the day, and it was bald. It's not as lush as it was. I remember going to Daylot first, and it was, you know, it was about of a drought, so, and there wasn't all the grass sod and everything. And boy, I was kind of like, what is all the hype, you know, here? Um, since then, I get it. Um, but well, and it doesn't always hit you on the first couple of visits either, I don't oh. think. It, I, yeah. put it I mean, I, one of I said the same thing a couple of times. I'm like, what? really? <laughs> and then, and then when you go on top of the world and there's, and it's a clear day and you can see across and, <laughs> and, you know, you get like 10 birdies in the round or something like crazy. And then, you know, well, for me, it was like five bogeys to go with them at least. So. And you get to sing happy birthday to Marty Hafner from the top of the world. I mean, those are just magic moments. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. I, but here's what I want to say on those baskets of De La Viega. So it was before like the replay rule and everything else. So I, I make a putt, it goes through the chains and rolls down one of the slippery hills you know and it just goes it is 150 or so deep so i went from a three to a seven back then to just get up it was just just brutal just brutal so I mean, yeah so you know, to win. <laughs> that happens out there too you know i mean it i told we, i've told this story already a couple times but when we had nate on i told the story about playing hole 20 and I rolled down in the canyon to the right. And, you know, halfway down, I realized it might be to my advantage to not find this. And that like- was my hole, 20, like, is it the Turner? Yeah, right there from oh. by the parking lot. Oh, that's yeah. the cliff. <laughs> so I, that's where you rolled down at? Yes, okay, I was so, like 20, actually, that's it. <laughs> yeah, so I go down, I keep going, I keep going. And, yeah, and the, the spotter's like, yeah, it was somewhere, last time I saw it was somewhere somewhere around where you're at and so i keep going keep going keep going and finally they go all right we ran the clock it's time come on up he said you saw him right here and i was like perfect we play the loop i come off the top of the world and i go just to look just to see my discs already lost and found <laughs> that was the same clip yes, and you know i mean like it's tough over there it's tough it's, it's tough. tough it's tough great group right. of people yes so, i miss out i miss out there this is really impressive too. Um, 30 PDJ national tour open women singles wins. It's a record for the most NT wins men or women. Yeah, I love that one too. <laughs> that one I, I knew. Over the do. <laughs> I bet yeah. you do. I yeah, can tell I mean, by the look on your face. Yeah, that's the gamer look <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah, that was that's huge, man. I remember just loving those events and playing them, and not really playing. You know, in the end, we played our tour that we wanted. You know, Jay and I, with being a little older, married. You know, we didn't do all of the swings sometimes. You know, I didn't go out to Memorial and because Texas was beautiful in the spring, and I loved hanging by the water and practicing and water painting or whatever else I was into at that point in time, you know, I wasn't ready to get out. So yeah, to, to hit that mark and not have played them all at the points that's and with men and women. I love it. I yeah. Love that's it. a good one. That's a really good that's, one. That's a huge one for sure. So from 06 to 19, you were the, the captain of the end of a women's team. 
And then you were a member of Team USA in the President's Cup. I assume that's in the same time frame. Yeah, I always I was only there once for the President's Cup. I never went to Europe to play um, back then. and just couldn't afford it to go over there. And it was only for about a week. You didn't get a like bookend a whole month or something over there. So it never seemed worth the value of going over. So I have yet to play. Um, well, I guess I've played when I helped with the Air Force and I, I have played over in Europe, but I haven't played like the European Open and some mm -hmm. of those bigger events that were right. pilly, super pilly, PDJ affiliated. Um, Oh, so yeah, President's Cup. I played the year they came. It came to the states. Nice. Where was that? Rock Hill. Oh, nice. Oh, all right. Yep. I might have been there. You, yeah, you were. It's the year they drove the <laughs> car into the truck or into the pond. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. So you were. Um, so the the rest after this next topic, we're gonna go stats real quick, like a bunch of them. And it's going to be like the overall picture, but you were the uh, the Wildflower Disc Golf Tour founder and assistant tour director. So am I supposed to assume that Jay's the the tour director? For the tournament? No, it is a women's only. So there's four women: Renee Farr, Chrissy Fountain, Stephanie Vincent, and myself. Nice. Uh, yep, we're all sponsored by Mint, and, and we do nothing of all this. No, so it is. It's in its first official year this year. Uh, we've had nine events. We've added a few, um, but their first event was completely sold out with over a hundred women. The next event sold out at 72. It was a one day we go through and we mark junior courses. We mark intermediate and recreational courses um, all on the same course. And then we have the open and the advanced play together so they can use their player ratings. You know, we put flowers in the toilets and all sorts of good things, make sure we have plenty of water. And yeah, we're really just as the name ensues, wildflowers, we're growing the seeds of women's disc golf and giving women a unique chance to play with each other on a weekly basis to get players packs that are completely for them get an experience that is completely for them we support sponsors that are women driven and we ourselves are for women doing the tournament so we do have a great group of men that help us but the core lead organization is all women driven for women that's awesome i didn't know anything about it i do i, I hope you saw that text today i did see that message from you about earlier on and i definitely want to talk to you about all that and i apologize yeah. for missing that text but i don't know how that just sometimes happens i guess but I didn't even know I had your number and then Jay sent it to me and I was like, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. I should have been paying attention minute. to this. So oh, anyways, crazy. all right. So here's some more impressive numbers. 427 career events, 205 career wins for 156, 84 and 80 cents career earnings. That's pretty impressive. You have 405 career pro events. 197 career wins in that. And then you have 370 career FPO events. Wait a minute. Am I making, am I messing that yep. up? Yeah, we have a combined total of 405 pro events. But oh, okay. All right. All right. FPO. All right. So that just threw me off. And you have 27 career FPO or FP40 events. So FPO wins 181 out of 100 and out of 370. And then that's a 48.9% win percentage. And then out of the 17, or you have 17 FPO wins, excuse me, FP40 wins. You had 17 of them, which is a 62.9% winning, winning percentage. And either one of those are amazingly respectable. Amazing. Um, I can even say I, it might have been 04, 05. It was the last time I had played in a division of less than three. So I don't really, I know. There's, wow, there's that's amazing. To look at that. 05, huh? Yeah, there's, there's a couple ways to look at that. You know, like I could have played and been the only person and then tried to foster women to say like, hey, come here. And that was my last uh, one where I played solo was Texas State's you know, urged me to play. And I was like, I oh, don't play. It's I'm the only one. So I would either play with the men or I wouldn't yeah. play. Most of the time I just played with the men and didn't care. You know, I just wanted to play. Um, so they asked me to play and they were like, we're just going to pay you good. And they did. Um, and then that was the payment was what they wanted to show. And then since then, women have played Texas States. Um, so that was a good yeah. mark. But a lot of those, you know, losses I do, you know, I played in different divisions. I didn't actually play in the you know, solely in the women's division. I don't have a whole lot of solo wins. Let's put it that way. 
Well, that's cool. And kind that's, of a norm back then. You that's know, that, that's thing. one of those. That's one of those things that I've I've discussed a little bit with Juliana from a couple of times when, you know, like there's even been a time where she came up to me and she goes, sometimes I wonder if, if all those years were, you know, I was that good all those years because nobody was showing up. And I was like, come on, when everybody showed up, you shined, you know? So, I mean, don't even think about that. That's not true at all. And, and, and that's, you know, and it's really nice that most of these women don't know anything about that, you know, because Heck yeah. There was such a, you know, such a long time where, you know, <clears throat> there was nobody for you to play with at all, you know? And it's so refreshing now too, that um, like Tatar, Pierce, Gannon, uh, Mandahanos, they get to actually be athletes, you know? I, and Juliana and Elaine, and uh, we had to do other things, you know, like and hustle. Uh, hustle. Yeah, you know, it. you know, we took yeah. your great Maceman doubles and paired it with the clinic, you know, so we were all trying to find a way to make things happen out there. We did free clinics and then ran doubles on the side to make, a, you know, help. We, you know, founded Edge to, you know, help out, subsidize, you know, just the lack of money. I, when Paige had me in her documentary interview, I did a quick little like number stats and she did not win any events at that point in time in the 2001 season that would have been the year yeah um but she finished good and so with that my all my world's wins wins didn't make as much money as her second third and fourth place finishes so wow. you know we were definitely doing a lot of different uh gear grinders to make it work but we i know i was touring i can say i get very upset um that people think like this is the official this stage of generation is the official touring stage of players and that is just not Man, true. there's been so many so many touring oh, workers absolutely and players for me you know so i'm not saying like i'm the start of it but i did you know like jay and i were touring professionals like we did everything we could to play disc golf solely and make it happen we didn't come yeah. home for a month in time and teach or do something else we were out there figuring out how to make a living at disc golf but to well, say that I'm so happy now that people are getting purses and legitimate contracts that you get to actually explore how good you can be. I mean, yeah. and I, I agree with that. And I also would say, too, that, you know, like, I mean, we already had Dan Ganley on and, you know, him and Steve Valencia were the first two touring players, period. That's what I would say. And, and so and Valencia is coming up. So, you know, we're, we're going to, we're covering that. And we're, that's, I mean, like you said earlier, this is the whole reason we're doing this. I mean, aside from, you know, personal reasons of, of uh, you know, me and B having such a great friendship and having so many miles between us and not getting to spend any time with each other. This is like a, a, a really good uh, facsimile for that. But the truth of the matter is that the, the thing that really, that drove me to even push this was these stories i mean there's just so many good stories and so many good times we've had so many monday fun days like i heard they don't even do that anymore i mean like there's not enough time it's yeah, that's, and that's not acceptable you know yeah. there's got to be time for that you know i mean it's i, I told belchek a story one time at he came to me at usgdc i think or it was else, else it was oklahoma open and it wasn't it, there was a gap between whatever event it was and the veterans park open and he goes oh man you know i'm kind of disappointed with this touring experience and i was like well wait what what you like i don't know if you remember this about belchick but like his whole tour he didn't hardly ever go on the interstate he was all back back highway state highways and national highways and he knew where every microbrewery was when nobody knew about microbreweries like he knew where they all oh there's one in this town man we're gonna go over here blah blah blah, blah. you know and, and like so he was, you know, he was two IPAs into every one of those drives. And he, you know, and I, I started pointing this out to him and I said, it's not just the days you compete. I said, what about Monday fun days? I go, what about this? What about that? You know, all these different times where we were all camped out together or different things like that. And, you know, he came back to me at veterans before he left, he didn't play the veterans, but he goes, Hey man, I just want to, I just want to thank you for pointing that out to me because you're right. I was only basing my experience and my judgment on the experience on two days of the week. And we had a whole lot of fun on those other five days. And, you know, that's, I mean, that's what, that's what it was all about. And that should still be some of it, but, you know, good for them. 
I'm glad they're I'm glad they're enjoying their success, you know? Yeah. But, I, I do you know, hope that, that is the, I hope the season gets a little shorter. They can condense it so people can have a little more um off time too. Because we are seeing, you know, a lot of injuries that are popping up on tour, mm -hmm. you know. So I do feel like the <laughs> times have changed. Change. Oh, and yeah, times have changed. And and I get it. I mean, it is you can't have it one way with saying like you're an athlete now with a good paycheck and then not expect to like have a fun day Monday where you drink IPAs. I mean, that yeah. those two things don't go hand in hand either. Yeah. But at some point a season needs to like not be 12 months either, you know. Right. So oh well, and that's I don't know. I mean, I, I was thinking about when you were talking about oh five, oh well, you know, like oh four, oh five, oh six, like that time frame we all felt like we had to be at every event too you know like the time like the the mindset i mean even when i wasn't playing i wasn't playing great golf but i still felt like i had to be at every event and i remember the first time i told nesbitt i got when remember when they used to have texas states after usugc oh yeah and, and i told him i go hey i'm coming but i'm not going to play and he goes what do you mean you're not going to play and i go nobody should be playing this weekend not one of us not anybody that played last weekend or had anything to do with anybody playing last weekend has no business playing this weekend he goes what do you mean and i go you just look look at all of them i go there might be two or three that play well and most of them are going to have a tough go because they're worn out and you should be you know what i mean you're at the end of the season and you just played one of the biggest events of the year you know yeah. it's the players that always play a tournament after worlds and especially the winner just blows my mind i'm like, always like wow how do i won one and had jay drive me straight to maine where we ate blueberry and lobsters all day long and camped and played travel scrabble <laughs> <laughs> that sounds exactly like what i'd expect out of the two oh, that sounds perfect that's right that's, that's living just, world there's camp absolutely Ireland. nothing wrong with that no no it's good stuff all right so last few things i have on this and this has been pretty extensive because you your career is pretty extensive um u.s tour rank is number 63 global master series rank is number 34 uh you got 26 straight years of playing pdj events uh you have elite level skills and world class and you're a world-class ambassador obviously and you're a constant advocate for girls and women in the sport and that is what i have for framework and i mean you could build like three houses on that framework right there <laughs> yeah man i only have one i guess that's <laughs> <laughs> well, living in the house that Des built, that's a pretty sweet little foundation right there. Yeah, and I still have veranda. that bobblehead up there. I got a wow. UNI Panther. There's the Hall of Fame plaque. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that's good stuff. I like that. You're nicely framed up by those Hall of Fame plaques, too. Oh, that's good, so, good that you mentioned the UNI because um, one of the things we like to do is talk about the origin stories. And, and Jay has already kind of gone over this and and you've got a really great phrase i think it was in your instagram post talking about um when jay was elected into the or inducted the texas disc golf hall of fame robert carrillo his longtime friend your longtime friend you described him as patient zero and i thought that was really great metaphor because we all have that patient zero the person who turned us on to disc golf and, you know, whether you think about it in terms of a viral metaphor or, you know, the 60s hippies giving you acid and turning you on and tripping you out, regardless, it's an expansiveness, con uh, consciousness expanding kind of experience. And we all remember that very first moment, that very first person, the very first bridge that got us into it. So at the time, you are an amazing athlete, high school standout. You had, I, I don't know, the, I have the research is varying here but you have at least 12 letters in high school you stand out in softball volleyball baseball track good enough to get you a full division one scholarship to the university of northern iowa where you play softball for the uni panthers and you are number 12 desiree how do i pronounce this ba Desra. Desra, 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 Desra. Yep. um from woodard iowa you had an amazing record, personal record of 14 and 7 in that standout 1993 season with a 1.76 average. You are looking at softball in your formative years. You're taking, I think it was marketing and commerce you were taking in UNI. Um, at the time, you're thinking softball, you're an athlete, you're already an athlete. You've, you've been long, many years of having that focus, having the discipline, having the training. At that time, could you see yourself being, was there a professional softball option? Could you see yourself moving huh. beyond the academic diamond? No, 
No, nope. softball kind of frustrated me a bit. I was good at it. Um, I had um, scholarships in all sports. I had actually had 17 letters in high school. So I lettered as an eighth grader. 17. Uh, yeah, 17, <laughs> I lettered and everything. Um, I was tracked for one year and decided, oh, hell no, I am not a runner. So I played golf, loved it. Um, volleyball was my true passional sport. I actually took that intramural at the University of Northern Iowa where the coach tried to take me off the softball team uh, to go on to the volleyball team, but he, you know, he had spent his money and that wasn't gonna work. And that's just like crazy talk. But um, so no, I didn't. Um, it frustrating just because I actually, you know, like my team committed a lot of errors. I, you know, like shoot, sometimes I'd do one, one hitter or no hitter and lose, you know, so softball, even though I was good, wow. it was very frustrating. We had a dome, so it was relentless. We were consistently pitching and catching and pitching where the team would be gone and it would be the pitchers and the catchers. We had a fall season and a spring season that had, you know, 20 plus games to 40 games. You know, I was barely actually at college. It felt like I was always on the basically the BT cruiser driving to Florida and different places. We never flew. So no, as good as I was at softball and um, I really did shine as a individual athlete. And so disc golf really kind of came into my wheelhouse um, with the exception of like volleyball, because volleyball was such a, you know, there's six players, three hits on each side. That is such a, that's almost like one working unit, you know? So mm -hmm. it was a little bit different than a softball player that's in every pitch. And then, you know, I, I, the smile was not probably as nice when I was in college as I was, yeah. you know, frustrated. And when you can't control errors and different things like that, I can remember being very mad about stuff to the point ah. when I crushed a orange juice bottle and cut my hand open. Yeah, it was fine. 12 with their great big things. There I am. Oh, that's a bottom left. Unbutton look. This is totally me. Here's everybody uppercutting and then. Oh, hippie D right here. There, there you are in your Pantene <laughs> years right there. They're looking good. So here's a funny trick. Um, have her stand. So when I, I actually wasn't a pitcher in high school. Um, I was a right fielder and a shortstop. And when our pitcher went south, so the coach was like, you got a good arm. How about you try pitching? So I tried pitching. And then in a year, I was, I had one year left. And then I got a full scholarship to pitch. So obviously the coach did a good job of recognizing that, yep, I could possibly do it. And I got better when I moved the three feet back. So 40 feet in uh, high school, I think it was in 43 in college, I was better because I was faster. I was a good spot pitcher and drop ball pitcher. Um, so <laughs> with, uh, who's it going with this in softball? Oh gosh, it's so funny. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, I lost my train of thought with that. Um, Softball, softball, JJ, this, oh, oh, with the career. So yeah, no way, you know, I just was like, so once I was kind of done with softball, I was, I was, I was done with softball. Disc golf came along and it was a great outlet, like Jay was saying, to, you know, get rid of the rigors of school and the travel and yeah, play with friends and still be athletic and be in control of my own game, which I loved. Yeah. If, oh, it's my fault it's my fault if it's my success it's my success Jeez, yeah. i'm my own best friend love it <laughs> <laughs> that's a great way of saying that now you were saying earlier before we went live to air about your hip and that a lot of um, softball pitchers had developed a particular gait and maybe some hip problems did you ever have any any right because you were a right-handed pitcher right I was, I would say with like the shoulders and stuff, I just have scar tissue. You know, if you lay down on the back, you can just, you don't have as good as rotation as you go through things, but disc golf itself was a good um, sport with softball and, you know, batting and stuff. The swing was really easy. Even though I was a pitcher, I was actually a good slugger. So uh, I hit the ball also. Um, yeah, the, the hip was a little bit for me, genetics softball and all that repetition and then 20 years of playing disc golf on on it i mean you're, you're starting to see other disc golfers starting to have that same kind of play either it be the knee or the hip and i think you know mine was the hip in the end i think there's a few people that have having some issues with the lower back as well like the champs got a big problem with his back i believe yeah and so that's you know i mean it's i think that's that's going to be something we see more and more you know it'll be interesting to see how that develops as people get older and especially the as hard and as far as these kids are throwing now, I mean, that's really, 
that'll be interesting to see what happens with them 10 and 15 years down the line so hey didn't By the way, um, just just before we go into that mace just i noticed that you you had a drink there last on friday we were talking to jay and he had a special sponsored beer that he was promoting are there any drinks that you're you're drinking on today that you want to let us know about I am not. I'm actually drinking, but I got this great best tournament ever, dudes dubs. <laughs> not to be missed, dude. That's uh, pretty sweet. So I'm actually just drinking water, but I did come from today. I ran up to Austin to visit Mint headquarters and see the vault and all things Mint, which is affiliated with Austin Beer Works. So I did have two tasty beverages oh, up there. Nice. Austin Beer Works. Why I was picking through this had a blood orange and uh floral and they were lovely um it's great there so i hope that anybody that visits the austin area uh go check out that austin beer works the mid course will be open soon the shop is fantastic it's a really cool scene up there right on. nice so hey uh just like a side thing on the uh on your origin story wasn't didn't you tell me your dad was a, a an official like a college official or something like that so we're pretty hall of famed out in this family with jay and i having three hall of fames each my dad is a hall of fame basketball official my uncle is a hall of fame volleyball official and jay's stepmother is a hall of fame government worker holy cow yeah <laughs> she's got in hall of fame. With the government this year so yeah it was pretty I, I married into some royalty and so did Jay. Now, not, not to dispute or, or quibble, but I think Jay, technically the Hall of Honor is also a Hall of Fame. So he's actually at four. He did. You are correct. He has officially surpassed me on that. It's uh, but she still got him in cool Sorry. points. So. Yeah, That's but good. I mean, a key to the city. I mean, yeah. come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah He's that's going. a good point that is a very good point <laughs> i'm gonna open up some country style ice cream from that quad cities have jade use that key it's the best <laughs> that'll be good so let's talk about first um what was your first disc do you remember i do actually if my i probably could get it it was a white cobra with a green stamp nice fantastic i still have it it has my desra b vout two zero it's almost like the two zero six uh it's almost the same address as i'm almost right now but in cedar falls so it's where i was living as a college student nice wow. i was a big fan of that classic cobra myself oh yes me too what about early heroes who were your early heroes in the game hmm being self-taught it's starting to sound I, like jay i know well it's so true i mean jeff harper from des moines was that's a good one yeah from for coming and doing a free clinic and actually showing how to throw a disc and he did this and, light pole or he stood right against the light pole and did a full swing and threw to keep the plane in it was mind-blowingly good and it was free so to this day i haven't charged for a clinic you know because of that great gift that jeff did for me um i want to continually you know as they say pay it forward so when continually pay it forward um and then as i got into it um elaine king she's just she's walked the walk so she has all the world titles she's been on the board of directors she's helped shape the sport she's great i just i i love her um i know she's taken some heat with some other stuff and been fried with other stuff but you know let it go people elaine yeah, is, uh, it's, that's uh we agree yeah. with 100 percent on that uh, i mean elaine's one of the smartest people in the sport absolutely if, if you four hours some... did not wipe out four decades so Let's, let's and let's yeah free lane yeah grow up and move on let's that and and jeff harper i mean i don't know if there's anybody that's smoother mm. than jeff harper i mean his action on the t-pad on uh, anywhere on the course really i mean he's he's on point for sure 
Very and then kind of, as you get into it, you just develop more heroes. I think, you know, the original mm -hmm. heroes are so hard. I think the heroes that I've gotten now are more substantial, you know, because I can see what they've done and I have a greater appreciation of how hard things have come. I mean, if I look at like Tom Schott, you know, there's someone that put a lot of like forward thinking out there with, you know, making people pay for things and showing the worth of disc golf. And he was just ahead of the game, you know, and that stuff is coming true right now. So these are those are heroes, you know, it, the Steady Ed Absolutely. Award that you said I got earlier, that uh, spirit of the game with Steady Ed, it's probably one of my top notch. You know, obviously the Hall of Fame for me is my best accolade, but that spirit of the game at that time with Fiona being there was great. Steady Ed passed the same year I won my first Worlds. It was in the 2002, he passed away right before. So he actually wasn't there to deliver the baskets with Ken and I. Um, so. It was it was a nice little full circle. I just felt like, wow, I finally got kind of all that nice little acceptance that a lot of people get when you win your world. And that was three years into your career. That's amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. Let's just we're, we're just going to jump into a quick little uh, segment of rapid fire. Uh, you know, we'll throw out a question throw out the, the answer. And I know some of them may be it's hard to to distill down all the many options into one, but just, you know, whatever just leaps out at you. Um, Let me warm up. Right, right there you go. Get the chicken wings going. Crank it up. Uh, right now, if you were to, to get deserted on Desert Island, what would be the one disc you would carry with you? Nocturnal Mustang. Ooh, one of the Sparkle Pony Boys. Very nice. Yep. Then it can glow in the dark and I should never lose it. And I can use it for a lot of different stuff. Oh, look, there's more than one reason. Good for her. That's good for you thing. all right so what about what's your favorite uh disc golf destination look at this we're making her think hard on two you know, well, I, I, I have uh had some great places to play on uh, new zealand oh it's just gorgeous i loved it new zealand okay yeah, because you can load up the van. I mean, we loaded up a van for 30 days and did, you know, three stints over there. Once on the north, two on the south, playing disc golf. And just like you guys were saying, in between, you know, all the waterfalls and the hikes and the people yeah. you meet and the mussels that we harvested off of the Black Beach. And so when you combine all of that, that's where I want to play. That's that's well, a great I, that's a really I good suppose answer. This next question is just going to fluff it up to to put the punctuation on that sentence. But your favorite tournament is that the the Paradise uh, Tournament in New Zealand? Well, yeah, but dude, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love uh, I love a recreational tournament. Like when I got into the sport, I was a complete competitive person. I absolutely because of Robert Creelo and stuff, and we played as a study break and really got that social aspect. So when I can have both of those two things, you know, they can't come simultaneously, but you can be both. Like I can be a fantastic recreational disc golf player and have a fucking good time. And then you know, strap on the hard hat and be a world champion, a world class player too. So yes, for you know, nah. Yeah, New Zealand was beautiful. Um, Derek Robbins course in England was great as a private course to play, but I, I love a little dude stubs. It's right here in the hometown. Everyone gets to kick it back and be themselves. It's private, it's good stuff. And a team tournament. We had Texas teams back in the day, camping championships. Man, some like of that. those, those are the best. The, I, like, I love the match play too, you know I mean? That's something that I, I, that's, we're gonna bring that back. Mace Man is gonna bring back a match play tournament for sure. That's because, because like I, well, and I got more stuff to talk about on that, on that front too, but we're not going to get into it today because it's not, it's coming. There's some cool stuff on the horizon with Mace Man as well, but that's one thing that I miss a lot. I really, really, really enjoyed like all those Sandy Point tournaments, you know, I got oh, to play in several of them. And then one year, like one of my few disc golf player glory stories is being a part of the team, we went without a grandmaster. So we were down seven points when we showed up on the property and we made the final. Yes. And we went, but we, but we made the final against Michigan with that okay. included like Gary Laura, Mark Ellis, Javier Kowalski, um, Rayleigh, uh, Darren Harper, um, Al Shack and Sue. And like, I'm sure I'm leaving several people out, but like almost everybody I just mentioned could play in open or masters. 
oh, and yeah. you know there's the shuffle and and so like i i i you know that was great i mean i i love and I, I had so many good times at Sandy Point too, and just playing that tournament, you know, that match play is something else. Yeah, I, and I can say the same thing, you know, besides the big wins and stuff, tur sometimes tournaments are tournaments, you know. Uh, my favorite state to play in is Michigan. Like, I love Michigan golf. I think it's beautiful the way it's cut yeah. with the prairies and just love it. And then it's in blueberry and cherry seasons and stuff. But my favorite memories are those those teen tournaments, those ones where it's a little more social active and, uh, yeah i mean and that's i don't know i don't know why it's just it is what it is oh i think it's a social activity for sure yeah gotta love the roaches uh, all right so oh i got two in a row nice non-tournament meal what's your favorite non-tournament meal what's that mean the meal that you're gonna eat in the tournament? evening like when you're not playing tomorrow what's your favorite meal tonight oh like what i what's like my favorite meal Is yeah well, some people, you know, they're the athletes, they just want to like carb up or protein oh, down or whatever. Like but, eat, you know, like if you're in dunkers? between, yeah, like if you're going to eat fried chicken or, you know. Well, something. then I would say for sure fried chicken. For okay. sure. <laughs> yes. Uh, I love some greasy fried chicken, especially from Louisiana and New Orleans. This is the nice. best. Yes. <laughs> um otherwise yeah i mean i kind of still eat pretty healthy everything in moderation you know i'm not i'm not a big salad dweller or anything else like that i don't feel like eating fried chicken is gonna you know as long as i don't eat it every day because you'll just get a gut ache um, yeah that's a, that's a really good point too i mean yeah. moderation well and then you know the guys that i came up with in the laser business they used to say moderation and plenty of it <laughs> that does too <laughs> yeah so B, you're up on the next one. All right, uh, you you had two in a row, but you only read one. No, I read them both. Non-tournament destination. Oh, I did. I skipped one. Ooh. This one might be better than any of the rest. What's your favorite non-tournament destination? My favorite non-tournament. So somewhere I just go to not just play. Just go well. to get away. You know, to just like like. I mean, man, I mean, there's so many different things you could say for that one. Mm, I probably really? haven't been to my non-tournament, favorite non-tournament destination yet, but I've got a I, bunch of them. I almost agree with that. Um, yeah, I mean, in the end, my, not to sound like a old snobby, but I'm going to have to kick it outside the United States. Come oh. on, United States. Italy. Italy was phenomenal. We, and I was we thinking, didn't play, we I was didn't thinking Venice. Also. Yeah, we didn't play disc golf there. We were working with the United States Air Force doing disc golf around the e region. So, you know, Italy was, oh, actually we did do Aviano Air Force in there. That's how good Italy was. I actually forgot I worked <laughs> in Italy. Italy so, was amazing. I got, to go, I got to go to Venice and Murano and got to go to the glass conference in Murano. And so for, for me, that would be, but that's, but but the reality of getting to go back there is probably pretty low because it's not really, well, I don't speak the language, first of all, and it's not necessarily, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, I've gone over there and they wouldn't let us in. I've also oh. heard a lot of people, like some of my friends that I made th that I made at the last conference and the one before, they were like, oh yeah, we were just there for a month. You know, we were just there on residence for a month. And I was like, oh my God, I don't know if I'd ever come back. You know, I mean. It was tough. I mean, they're so beautiful the over there. It's great. I love the wake up later, eat later, lazy. You know, it's not lazy. It's just, it's laid back. Yeah. yeah training is what it is yes <laughs> oh okay nice so so when you're when you're waking up in the morning you're driving to the the course you listen to the music maybe you're an i you know an earbud listener maybe not but what is the music that just pumps you i know you guys are huge into live music you watch a lot of shows you're a real big music fanatic but what it like if you were to put on your uh, you know either it's uh Spotify or your iPod or whatever. What do you listen to? What's what's pumping up your jam? Um, I'm a big Grateful Dead, I, so I love the Dead. Um, that was probably my go-to if like I'm just like stuck and I don't know what I really want to listen to. I'll totally just kick on some Dead. But you know, I listen to a ton of stuff. I love Primus and Les Claypool. I mean. When you gave me that great Mr. B uh, the introduction at Toronto when we played. Um, I queued up. I thought this is gonna put me up because I heard that you know in the radio. I was like, I love this song. 
Red Hot Chili Peppers, Nobody Weird Like Me. It's got that ripping opener, you know? Um, oh yeah, I ripped that whole, whole one. You gave me that great opener. My big old Nobody Weird Like Me is going on. And then I threw it into the water twice and then shanked it over <laughs> there somewhere else and ended up like double bogeying that hole every time. It's an opener. <laughs> so I kind of have to... As much as I love a big rock tune, you know, I kind of got to <laughs> dial that amp down a bit. <laughs> Be a little precious. more twirly twirl. <laughs> that makes sense. That totally makes That's sense. Totally what's your, sense. So what's your favorite guilty snack? Favorite guilty snack? Um, Ditto honeys. Ditto honey. Hey, not too guilty, <laughs> but they're still a very nice snack. All right, so we're going to... We're going to go with sports teams here. A lot of people, especially people who move from one place to the other, or if they go to college in a certain place. I mean, Harold's got a really interesting genealogy of sports teams that he's got here. So we're going to just go through a bunch of different types of, you know, sporting categories here in terms of college football. And I guess just saying college, I imagine the answer is already going to be, but. Panthers! You, <laughs> you and I, Panthers. So college basketball from the same school? Yeah, I'm. Yep. Yeah. You're loyal. Any NFL teams that you support? Uh, yeah, New Orleans Saints. Who dat? Who dat indeed? What about the NBA? Hmm. Um, back in, I, I don't really follow it too much, but back in the day, I loved the Atlanta Hawks and Dominique Wilkins. Stud jammer had a poster above my bed, and then as I got a little older, I guess you know, a little older in high school, I liked uh, the Utah Jazz with the Stockton Malone combo of actually running plays. That was super solid. No one can stop the mailman, that's for sure. All right, uh, anything with uh, MLB? Cubs. Cubs. Quick answer. Very what about quickly. NHL? Oh, one for me, stars. <laughs> <laughs> I do root for them only because of me. <laughs> That's a good one. Well, there yeah. you go. And you know, Maybe. you can always take a little drive and go to a game anytime. So, and, and I can't say, like, as sporty as I am, I really don't watch or root for a whole lot of sports. And so, when it does come time, like, doing the march madness brackets i really just pick the teams that i know my friends really like like it's so I, easy for, to pick the faves too you for, know what I mean? like, so with kansas you know i'm always like go kansas or uh cunningham with south carolina gamecocks you know so i tend to like pick my friends teams because i don't really <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome how about soccer anything with soccer oh no okay <laughs> so what, what's your favorite sport to watch then Hmm. Football, NFL. Okay. And other than disc golf, what's your favorite sport to play? Is it volleyball? No, nah, golf. Golf. Okay. By the way, you had a really great uh, photo of yourself as an all state golfer on your Instagram. Really awesome. And just before we forget, when you're talking to music, um, I really, I, Roy Ayers is one of my all-time idols, and it's rare to see anybody put a Roy Ayers track anywhere. And to see him on your posts, rope swinging into the river, you, you. I had to push the tear back in, okay? That's how yes. it was. Oh, appreciate it. I do, that is the one thing, you know, if you do know me, um, I am now almost two years of having a smartphone. I had no phone beforehand. I had a flip phone for a while. Um, it was a hard learning curve. That's why I only had one number for you guys. Yeah, I was like, why ask. is it that I only have one number for Jay and Des? Because I refuse to have one. Because so you didn't have one forever. Yes. Even our Facebook page was created by someone to start with. And then we, you know, we have taken it over because, you know, it's lying if you don't. That's um, a tool yeah and it's a tool it's a tool now so yes i have enjoyed being able to just like listen to music to clips and stuff i find that to be so much enjoyment and then if i get a music head uh, i got a real good buddy tony ketz in michigan so he's always just like oh my gosh what a deep dive on some you know great musicians that i put on there so thanks nice. well i got it man it's great that you mentioned tony ketz too because i got to play around with melinda ring um tony ketz um bill lauer Ooh. nate majeski oh, that's and got so a big hug from becky right before it and i feel horrible because i'm terrible with names but there was another guy that i know from back in that time frame and his son that played with us and i can't remember their names but 
it was so cool. Like I had, I, I, it was a total surprise that I got to run into any of those folks, but Tony Ketz was a complete surprise because I was like, I hadn't even thought about Tony in a long time, you know? So that was, that was a great good. That was like how I started my Detroit uh, glass conference that's, trip. Oh, that's fantastic. That's a good. Yeah, and we played it. Nate, at, up there. We played it Nate and Becky's on um, Nate and Becky's course. Yeah, nice. So, so that was really, really cool. Definitely good times to be had. So, uh, current beverage selection. So, what are your beverages of choice right now? What's your go-to drink? Hmm, I'm just straight beer drinker in the end. Um, I love tequila. That's a that's just a good drink, and I don't want to mix it with anything. I'm just good old tequila. Yeah, uh, right on. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so now this is uh, I, we don't have the siren or the red light anymore, but uh, this is the official nerd alert. What's your geek freak? What do you what do you stand on? Is it geeky that I don't know what that means? What is that? <laughs> <laughs> are, are, are you like into crochet? Do you like Game of Thrones? Oh, you like okay. I actually I do a ton of that stuff. Um, I have created when I went to school, I actually graduated with a public relations degree. I have a coaching and art minor. Um, so I have created a lot of different things. I have I've done stained glass, I create wood baskets, I've done some scratch arts. So I have a whole bunch of other stuff. I just got into, well, I haven't started it, but I bought, you know, stuff to do paper quilling. Um, so I like to dabble in a lot of different. What's uh, paper quilling? You take little str strips of paper and you roll them up and then you create different um, mosaic patterns with it. I've got some ideas for baskets and different things. Oh, cool. Did you, did yeah. you do this stained glass here? I did not do that one, but that was given to me by Becky Zalek. Oh. Yep. So that's a good old dear one right there. Wow. Yep. Obviously. That's yep. beautiful. That's a good picture. That was okay, a good so spot. that's that's our that's our quick little quick pulse get to know you. We're trying to sharpen our game for our uh, when we're at the USDGC when we want to throw twenty one questions at people, but. Um, we talked about the streak and oh, what an amazing thing it is. You also have another streak that's actually really amazing as well. And Mace, maybe you want to talk about this, your your world's appearance from 2002 to 2010. Unparalleled maybe in the history so far of this golf. That's Ken Climo. Oh, okay. and Paul well. McDonald might have tied it because I saw him do a post too now. But I appreciate that. Oh, spoiler alert, crowd. It's placing first or second at Worlds for like nine years or so. Sorry, I jumped the gun on that one. That's okay. That's all right. That's all right. It's good that you know your stats. So yeah, from 02, <laughs> from 02 to, to 2010, you were either first or second for all of those. One, yeah. two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times. Oh, seven. Six losses feels like seven. <laughs> Six losses. <laughs> Shoot. So, I mean, let's 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 take it to two thousand two. You are you take you storm onto the scene. You you I think it was ninety eight, ninety nine, two thousand, two thousand and one. You had four years from going from total recreation, like thinking these discs were more wall hangers than anything else to winning the world championships. That's a learning curve that's, I don't even know how steep that curve is. So maybe we could talk first, the first world win. You said the first worlds always stick with you. You'll yeah. always be a world champion. And I would say, even with that like curve, and Jay had kind of talked about that with, you know, we only had one disc, you know, I, I won a tournament. My first tournament I won was with one disc and then I got another disc, I got a gazelle. So I had a Cobra and a gazelle and a Pepsi windsock and a extra large white tank top <laughs> is what I want. <laughs> the Pepsi windsock was great because we had the concessions business. So, and we sold some Pepsi on the side. So I got to use that. The gazelle was a great driver to go with my, you know, Cobra. And I kind of played like that up until that point of about 2000 or so when we joined the PDJ with the super tour, because you had to have your PDJ number at that time. And so, you know, we signed up in the Madison, like Jay had talked about. And um, so, so yeah, my learning curve was really 
really pretty quick because back then you only got to pay a dollar if you wanted to play any tournaments. And in Iowa, we didn't have A tiers. So everything was basically a C tier. So we just would pay a dollar and I'd play with the disc or then the two discs and maybe get a few more discs. So I didn't have any on the wall at that point in time in 2002 when I came down, but I did know um, we wanted to be serious about it. And so that's what prompted us to move out of Iowa. We just knew we had to get out of Iowa um, for the winners if we wanted to train and take disc golf seriously. And with both Jay and I being scholarship, full scholarship athletes and coming out of university debt free, it allowed us to take that chance on ourselves. You know, nice. a lot of people reported that luxury and we just said, let's do it, you know, and we created a business, you know, and we knew we could succeed at that. And we didn't bring the business down to Texas. We sold the business off, but all of those belief moments and taking advantage of the opportunities that were gifted to us um, kind of made disc golf an easy get into that's really interesting i never really thought about coming out of college without the debt you know because like well i mean let's face it most of the disc golfers aren't going to college so you know i mean you guys took I and mean, i don't mean that in a bad way but no. most of them aren't you know what i mean like i know like all the especially not the youngsters i mean like i think the well i mean i heard that i think i remember the story that aaron gossage was a college graduate with an it degree and he was trying to decide whether he was going to use it or not and <laughs> i know that, that vinny's Vinny's got, uh, he's a chemist, correct? I mean, I think so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so, and, and so, I mean, I'm not saying that none of them go to college, but it's, you know, that's an interesting dynamic there, you know, I mean, that's, that's another good question to ask, you know, I mean, maybe not on the show, but you know, it's definitely another one to ask some of these folks because, well, I mean, I only know a few things about these young guys anyway, so. Yeah, it definitely was just a, it, you know, it was a good leap of faith. I'm glad we took it, you know, because you just, you didn't, we didn't have anything to lose, you know, there was nothing stopping us from trying, you know, you can well, always just pick plenty of jobs in Texas if you need one. So, I mean, like you picked a good spot to go to if you had to jump into we something did. else, you know, I mean, there's plenty of that right where you're at. So, yeah, that's yeah, pretty, that's really impressive, though. I mean, I, I had not thought of that one. Yeah. So yeah, when we came down in 2001, we would have come down in 2001 and then I won the worlds in 2002. So I was named rookie of the year in 2001 at that same PDJ 2002 worlds that I had won. Um, and that same year, Jay and I won our first mixed doubles too. So it was a great lucrative year in 2002. I even won the U S women's, I, you know, followed it up. And I think that's why 2002 seemed so, um, important uh, because I backed it up, you know, I, I, I did put my walk, you know, anyone can come in and, and sweep someone and, and take like, you know, Julia was at the top of her game and anyone can come in and just kind of swipe out and dethrone someone and then win once, you know, and then never win again. Flash in the pan. Yeah. Flash I, the pan. And then three months later, I still, you know, put a game together and, and won later as being like you guys said, someone new to the scene. Like I definitely was not known. I came down to Houston and just met, you know, a bunch of people in Texas and it's like, let's play disc golf. Yeah. <laughs> kind of, kind of well, thing. you know, I think that, I think too, though, I would say that I would actually counter that with, with this, that I don't think that, I think from a world championship standpoint, that was probably almost impossible to do to sneak a world championship out, like sneaking other wins out. I think it was way more doable, but like, if you really, like, if you got a world championship, I don't really feel like that was a sneak. I mean, like, like that, like it's really hard to do that, right? Especially back then, it because it's a, really it, back then it was the endurance contest. It wasn't just like a four round tournament. And I think like now our five rounds, excuse me, five and a half rounds, whatever, as a pair posted nine and a half rounds. I think that that sneak is more doable now, almost. Hmm. But I still wouldn't say that because I don't think any of those women are slouches now. I mean, like there's no there's no fodder in that division. You know, there's every, any one of those women could win on any given weekend. And, and, you know, I think a lot of y'all could, were doing that too back then. So, I mean, well, if you look yeah. at 2002, you played uh, 19 events FPO, you finished no worse than third in 19 straight events oh, wow. and you had 18 caches. Well, more thanks. of that streak. Yeah. Rookie of the year fodder for sure. Yeah. That was good. <laughs> 12 wins, two seconds, five thirds, and you won the, the world's mixed doubles with Yeti. Mm -hmm. So those were the days 20 plus years ago now. 20 plus. <laughs> yeah. I know, right? 
So hey, one, stop looking at us though. It's the fountain of youth. <laughs> exactly. You know what? You know what? Smiling, joy, happiness, laughter. That's all the secrets of a, a long life, a, a very successful, serene life. And if anything else, I don't think anyone has ever caught a picture of you or Yeti not smiling. So there's the secret of eternal home, the youth right you there. Just, we just have to look harder, really. But yeah, I mean, you got to look harder. <laughs> so one of the things we want to uh, we want to ask you about, um, we are getting kind of well beyond our good times hour, and we don't want to stretch it too long. But I want to talk to you about some of your players, your competitors that you play against. Particularly, Stat Mando is really good with a lot of people who are still current, still playing their their record sweep maybe not go back as far so i wasn't able to see your head-to-head -head record with leslie or sue stevens but among those two plus juliana obviously elaine and valerie those were the five women with whom you most often at least compete at the highest levels but there'd be regional players that you know would be good at their course but these were the women who traveled the length and breadth of the united states playing these huge tournaments so talk to us about what was it like, first of all, playing against Elaine? Uh, Elaine is just, when we talked about her earlier, um, incredibly intelligent. And so she's almost as a competitor, um, she's just like a psychological player. She's very generous when she plays, but she is, she, her tendency ticks are more psychological. So if she says anything, you know, it can be just, you know, it's kind of like, mentally you know challenging you know and that's yeah. just kind of like and that's just a tick you know everyone has certain ticks i'm sure my tick is i'm more of a non-talker you know hard hat stern person as a player i'm not quite for sure how people you know interpret my play um so that would be elaine but she's really incredibly bubbly i remember seeing elaine once um someone laid up a putt and rightfully so and then she just went murk, 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 murk. So, you know that's kind of like the psychological warfare that might go on sometimes with her juliana and i i can say didn't we kind of overlapped in our competition so we were head to head right there in the beginning but then she really started to fade out right when i was hitting more of more of a I, I, like a solidified professional instead of just that quick uprise that I had when we were still playing. And then I kind of came into my own as a competitor right when she was leaving. So my main competitor um, and player that I would play against and with, I guess, would be Val. So Valerie Jenkins at the time. Um, her and I would say we had the biggest duels throughout my career. And then along with that group was um, Leslie Brinster toured around quite a bit oh, back yeah, then. Yeah, right um, Yep. So Leslie Herndon, Leslie Todd at the time, had one of the very first rollers for women. Uh, Ruth Steele had a wicked forehand, some one of the very first uh, wicked forehands that women threw. Uh, Nadine Larkin was also a great player, that regional player that we'd see, you know, kind of come in and come out of. And right then, on, I remember Nadine as well. I would even, uh, and then we got Carrie Burlogger was a big competitor. Oh. She was always on those podium finishes with us. And I can say when I first kind of started playing in my first world was an amateur in 2000, Deb Renner was in the final four of that group and her. Oh, yeah. We forgot all about Deb. Yeah. So I remember rewinding the VHS a lot on that tape to watch Deb Renner's, you know, strong putt, forceful putt. Yeah, and I, I really haven't yes. played with her, but I just re remember she was really playing. dominant while she was around, and then and then I wonder whatever happened to Deb. I'll have to look into that. I think she's in Florida. Well, yeah, she was from Sarasota, if I'm not mistaken. Fair enough. Yeah, so that would make sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're good at geography. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you're a teacher and stuff, so. So. Yeah kind of jumped in on your space there on that one. No, it's quite space. all right. I'm just trying to figure out where to jump into now. <laughs> let's, let's talk. Obviously, we, we mentioned in the framework that you were the Innova team captain for the women um, for 14 seasons. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, you've moved on, but that was a major epoch in your playing career to have Innova as your main sponsor. You had... Um, how many discs did you have as a signature disc with Innova? Well, I mean, technically zero. I mean, a signature disc is something like I have with Mint, 
currently with a goat that sells in all sorts of stores that people can get that I get a, you know, a real royalty over with Innova, it was a signature disc when you're part of the team. Tour uh, series or? Tour series, yeah. So okay. it's a little different. And yeah. then, you know, with those tour series, we never really were quite sure, you know, how many were run what how many were in the allotments you know kind of things like that but um innova did do me a solid so i had the champion firebird and then a star firebird i was one of the first of the tour players that uh created their own artwork numbered those discs when we got a hundred of them at the time to sell and uh man they tooled that does reading stingray i know exactly like i wanted it and that that's been a you know that's a great disc I'm, I'm super proud of that disc that's been a really you know it's it's not quite ran anymore by innova but there's a bunch of those des redding innova um throwers out there and you know innova innova knocked it on that one they did a good job well reddit is a have, a, have what i have with mint that's for sure right. um i well, was excited to be the captain of the team i can say as the captain of the team um I wish, and maybe it's just the women's part, it's hard to say, we would have had more, or they would maybe listen to me a little more, like I gave them Paige Pierce to someone to look with, thank goodness Haley King is now on their team, um, I remember filming Haley playing in Wisconsin really early on and shooting them, you know, videos of her as a captain and, you know, they just passed over some really good players, you know, mm -hmm. as being that captain figurehead, but I also changed a lot of the good stuff that Innova does now, which is have great uniforms for their teams. You know, I would do a lot of ordering for the women's to make sure we had women's cuts. So I didn't look like the champ wearing the champ shoulder <laughs> cuts and everything else like that. So they did give me a I lot of power. Big shoulders and, too. They are big shoulders. They gave me a lot of power to make sure that the women were respected. And that stuff is now carried forward on the Innova's team. That's nice. cool. So obviously we've got to talk about Mint. They picked you up in 2021 was it 2021 correct uh, the end of 2021 full right? mint bag i was full mint bag from the start right on yep um their their disc selection and especially now with the addition of the lobster so it's got that understable mid-range um they have a complete full lineup right now um i'm finding some nice replacements i think for me the the biggest learning curve was i was just throwing a lot of old innova you know that's plastic stays unless you lose it and it gets those like yeah, you're man, them into different layers you know and so that you find star and champion good. stays in your bag for years and years it well does. so let's so tell us what's in your bag since so, you know especially since like especially b and i don't know anything about mint i mean i know a little bit about it but i don't i don't know enough about it how about that okay fair enough so you know they have three different types of runs of plastic they have uh eternal plastic um apex plastic and uh, the royal like royal plastic sublime. and the sublime oh yeah i always forget about the sublime too um so with those despite plastics i'll just go with what i'm throwing my main driver is the longhorn um if i was to compare this because we all like to compare this and i yeah. my will also is comparing them to innova this a longhorn is like a wraith my goat would be like a destroyer so my goat i use it basically utilitarian heavy winds big spikes i won the waterloo classic basically throwing my goat around because it was super windy that day and it just never failed and never foddered um the mustang is one of the best mid-ranges i have ever thrown i think it buries the rock it you know just does everything and those different slots of plastics that they have really do make a difference across that mold to stability to feel so I'm really enjoying the Apex Mustangs and the Nocturnal Mustangs, like the one I would take on the beach with me. And um, I'm putting Is Nocturnal a glow, is that their glow word? That's right. Okay. And that's sweet. Um, soft Profits. I put with Soft Profits and I approach with a profit and a bullet. And then I'm throwing right now the Sublime Lobsters for straight shots. That's finding a really nice balance of where my Des Stingray was at. And the Apex Lobsters are a nice turn comparatively to like a Champion Stingray. And the Jackalope, oh my gosh, Jackalope and Freetail are perfect straight flyers. Fairway driver, Jackalope, Freetail is like a roadrunner, a longer finesse driver. They're, stay mint. They're really good. Hey, the plastic's great. It's right here in my hometown. These are boys that you know have somehow in this full circle of my disc golf life 
you know, fell into that circle and now we're both working together and harmoniously. It's it's magic. That's so really I know cool. I know Guy, but I don't know the other people that are involved. Um, Zach and Chris are the the three that are also in there. Um, Zach used to work for Dis Nation um and has a bunch of you know retail experience and disc experience and then chris also was with bearded brothers and so he brings disc golf and all of them bring uh, a professional business background to mint and how many of those are actual i know the goat is a signature disc for you do you have other ones with mint yet or are they all no um the goat is my signature disc as of now okay oh okay we'll That's tune in later <laughs> maybe when we maybe when we interview you at USDGC, you'll have some beans to spill. Maybe yeah. I love beans too. Uh, the best. Yeah, we. Well, so we, hey, we should say something about that too. Um, we talked with Jay. We Jay, Paul and I talked after we interviewed Jay the other night, and then sent a message the next day over to y'all. And um, obviously, we're not getting to edge tonight. I mean, oh, that's we're great. Gonna, no, we're no, going to no, keep we're... on going, but everybody needs to know that we're going to. Um, we're going to combine the two of them together. It might be the first time we do that so far. We've pretty much been very adamant about keeping even spouses separate on their own day so that you don't over one doesn't overshadow the other. But um, this obviously is, you know, a good segue for we're going to interview you two together about Edge at the birthplace of Edge in Rock Hill from the Vendor Village that used to be the Edge Village. And um you know all that history you know we're gonna spill all of those beans then too but you know maybe you'll tell us what you're holding back now then i might do that yeah i'm very excited uh if anybody if you guys uh stay tuned for this at the usdc the usdc is going to be in its 25th year right 25th year big year, year. Oh, big year yeah so if yeah. you ever thought about coming out for a vacation you won't regret it it is I've been time. Telling this forever and actually rock and pat are coming and <laughs> they in rock blamed me he goes oh well it was because of your invitation and i was like well i'm glad somebody finally listened so is, rock and pat are going to be at uscdc so them too. it's been a while since i was out there and then last year coming back um it is just still the benchmark to tournaments uh the u.s championship and the crew there with jonathan pool and the end of the team has really laid the the important groundwork historically to how you run a tournament how you make players feel how you make your vendors feel how you make your spectators feel how you make your crew feel um it's i agree with all of that groundbreaking for 25 years my hat is consistently off with mad respect for that team out there um you included mace you've been on that forefront from the beginning also uh it go check it out go check it out live it also correlates now with uh throw pink and the throw pink championship i also got to help with sarah nicholson with the women's event that goes out there too so girls boys everyone men and women it's, be, it's, it's for everybody be really, out there really, really good and then on top of it then women's nationals is right the weekend before that right. the week well no it's two right well, it's two weekends it's it's really it's it's the weekend before the championship week starts not the weekend of what's known as us doubles weekend now in um in rock hill so right. there's lots and lots of good stuff going on and then you know obviously the tour championships right after that too so i mean i'm glad i'm so glad because we're actually flying jay out he's training a bunch of teachers in uh North or South Dakota right before uh, the championship. So I was like, oh my gosh, we got our dates <laughs> dates wrong. We're backing them up. <laughs> stacking, stacking. Well, and that's going to be two different bags too. Like he's going to have to like pack some summer clothes and like ship them or something. Cause uh, yeah, you, we're trying to back be, her right now. You might be needing the coat up there in North Dakota in October. I am excited. September. Thank you guys for taking that moment to highlight Edge. Edge has been uh, working hard steadily for 20 years, and we're excited to well, tell it. Well, totally makes it. sense. And obviously, I mean, we can still go for a while. We've got a little bit more to cover, but that's we got to cover that. that. We can't. Yeah. That's. I mean, there's things that we can skip when we're talking to anybody. That's not something we can skip when we're talking to the two of you. It's just. I mean, and 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 that's definitely well. And 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 as we're finding out, well maybe an hour isn't enough time and a lot of people are going to need two two segments you know i mean or else a really long sunday afternoon at some point you know i'm windy <laughs> even though that was my brother's name for as a my my nickname was slick from grandma travis was windy but i can be windy too 
<laughs> You're pretty slick as well. <laughs> Grandma you know, knew. <laughs> we, uh, you played a lot of, obviously a lot of, we already gone through the numbers, however many tournaments you played. But uh, one of the things that you posted, which is really cool, are pictures of some of the trophies. This yeah. to me right here, look at you two, look at these trophies. Those are gorgeous. They're this some of my sweet. favorites. This must rank in the top echelon of the trophies of all the major trophies you've received. Yep. That, that's got to be up there. That, and yep, that one's a beaut. We have a picture here just of uh, kind of a cluttered uh, sunshiny. But it looks <laughs> like, it, is this a trophy right here? Yep, that's uh, Santa Cruz or Portland. It's one of those two. And we have another one here. And yep. is this just a statue or is that a trophy? Oh, that well? was a trophy. That was, that was one of Jay's. That's our wedding topper. The, the skeletons. <laughs> so that basket that you outlined, that you wrote, that you pointed out in the middle after, I think the glass one was probably a Suhaki basket, right? That sounds right. And I actually got to spend some time with him the other day and see him make a couple of those fish. And that was pretty neat. And I've known yeah. him for a long, long time, but I'd never been to his place or anything. But the other one that you, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the other one that you ran the miles up and down on is a John Garman basket. So that was probably maybe a VPO win. Absolutely. Or, or uh, mm. I, I tended I to take, it was VPO. I took those out of, because they would mount them on maybe like the Plexi of Texas. So mm -hmm. I have a few with the Plexi of Texas up on my mantle still. Um, but if the Texas or yeah, whatever, I just didn't really like the Texas as much at one point or it didn't look as good as the others. Those popped out and they go in plants and they're beautiful. So those baskets have, are amazing. Those are amazing. baskets are, he made that with like brass wire and a soldering iron. Yep. I even have, let's see. One of his little earrings, which is phenomenal. He has got good work. We did one of his baskets for our Texas collegiates too. Oh, oh that's that. Greg Brooks. Wow. Oh yeah, that's right. That's Greg Brooks work. He's also here in Texas, but he's way out yep. West. And yep. I, I think I saw him in passing. I know that he was, pl he played in the Flagstaff, but. It was in Flagstaff. I didn't, Flagstaff. Get, I didn't I get a chance to talk to him. Yep, that's why I clued it off too. Jay actually saw him and I did not because we were swamped at the Fly Mart. I imagine. I wish I could have stayed for that, but it really would have fouled up the rest of the week for me. It would have made it to where I couldn't play Milo McIver. So, and I would have really, really, really had to push it. So, anyway. Oh, sorry. Uh, right there when I said, see ya. Do you remember you used to always go, see ya? So oh, I yeah. tried, tried to do that on my phone as my voicemail. Uh, I got to change it because it sounds so like nasty, rude. It's not you. Because, you know, well, I got that. Wanna, I'll tell voice. you what, next time we were together, if you want me to record that for you, I will. I thought okay. about it. Okay, cool. I can pull that off for you. For Just sure. record it on your phone and send it to her. Then you got a <laughs> digital file. That's a so, possibility. We're uh, we're gonna have to shut this down eventually. We could we could talk for days and days, of course, and it's just awesome to see you. It's been it feels like when I see your smile, like it hasn't no time has passed underneath the bridge. But speaking of water, speaking of bridges, speaking of of exciting places to be, one of the things that really struck the tickle bone with me that I really wanted to go and I wish I could have was the disc golf cruise. Oh, that was just. Mike Barnett and Cindy, that was such a great concept. Um, so proud to be, had done 10 to 11 of those. I can't quite remember the actual final number because we had the one that never, you know, like didn't actually go anywhere and we sunk a barge and everything. But um, yeah, we have just made so many kind of like random friends because it pulled a whole bunch of different disc golfers together and it gave the couples and the wives and the kids and you know there are there are kids that came back from the original ones that are now adults and we've seen them on the disc golf scene and it is just and we always had such a smashing time because it wasn't just that tournament where people would just remember like oh i shot bad or i shot poor no one ever can hardly remember. I mean, you, what you remembered was ocean was casual, you know, so you better go out there and swim and tread water, <laughs> get your disc and throw it. And then, you know, catch the trolley cart with the drinks when it comes through. So, you know, oh, wow. good that stuff. Is... And then we had good hosts with uh, Sean and Juliana for a while. And then it just went out with the blaze of glory and epic fashion when we landed with Nate and Val. I mean, the four of us with Jay, myself, Nate and Val, um, we're all organizers. We're all super fun. And those were the, the glory days. Good times. And I, I saw a picture. I, I don't know if it's a quick little video on your Instagram. 
at one point Jay's doing a little disco dance up on the stage with oh. everybody. <laughs> oh there, yeah. Were there other people on board? Was just disc golfers on board this group? No, right? that one was just us. But he yeah. always kind of gets picked for some of those things. Yeah, so Jay's not, not above getting up on stage and doing a little dance. I mean, you know. He's it's, shiny. The people just see him out there. That was my birthday day. Nice. <laughs> Maybe I was radiating off of him. I don't know. But yeah, he got up there. It was good. That was a good trick. That magician was good. <laughs> well, I wish, uh, you know, I wish everybody could have experienced the disc golf cruise. I wish I could have gone on a cruise and, and hung out for, I think at the start it was three days, but then by the end it was a seven day cruise. Is that right? Yeah, we did a bunch of different ones. Um, five days to seven days. Yeah, okay. five to seven. We might have did one very first at three. I don't know. Three seems too too quick. Seems like we really, would take yeah. 18 baskets and then we'd have basket captains and then you would hide them under your bed. And then, you know, we got first disembarkment. And so the disc golfers would come back. We'd have our 18 basket captains and we all got on the little, you know, boat and we'd get out there. And then the people who are basket captains got to then just go party and wait for us. And then the four hosts would go out and we'd madcap, you know, set everything up and get it all laid out. And Mike had already scouted out the location. And so we knew where everything was going to go. And then it was just shotgun on. And uh, the first cruise, we tried to do two rounds and we could only get one round in. So we canceled one and we only had like maybe one person kind of give us the uh, then, only one. Yeah, maybe only one, and we just told him to go play. Just this go play. We didn't take the baskets down. <laughs> we didn't take the baskets down. So then we learned to, you know, basically make it non-sanctioned and uh, one round. That's awesome. Yeah. So yeah, fun. that's really. I mean, that's I've that's probably great, a good call. I've had some great opportunities with disc golf, with the disc golf crews, working with the United States Air Force, working with schools. Um, helping women's i've done lead conferences at pe conferences also at parks and recs so you know principles think, convention absolutely and i think early on you know like being a world champion you're just gonna you should use that to help yourself which in the sense helps the sport so right. you know i've tried to walk the walk of being a world champion and have it open doors not only for me but the sport itself so they both kind of work like this Let's wow. let's uh let's tell one more story before we go. I want I want you to tell I want you to tell everybody what it was like to go to the principals convention and hear everybody talking about the principal that that spun the wheel and killed it on the Price is Right and then coming almost immediately to Phoenix and hearing all your friends in Phoenix talking about another one of your friends that was on the Price is Right that happened to be the same episode. Like I how didn't know this? Yeah, well you do I now. Know you wow but you didn't know that even then no he was on the same episode because like i thought you knew that when we watched it at dan's house because you guys were there with dan when we watched it at dan and sue's yeah i missed yeah, but that the principal, part. so you guys did so everybody that doesn't know jay and des did a presentation of edge at this principal's convention in san diego up oh, san diego yep. okay and uh, Not all about that like later that weekend or earlier that week we were all on the price is right and not just uh not just me but one of the principals was in the group like if you watch the show we're on the next to the last row and the principals are on the last row <laughs> and like we hung out with them almost from the time we got in line on all that day like we were in line for like three hours before they turned us loose and so we made friends with them and, and then the and they gave us numbers and everything so we got back in line when we came back and we ended up sitting beside, uh, sitting in a row in front of him. And so he won like the showcase showdown and he was at your convention where you were presenting at. And so I'm sure wow. like I figured that they must have just been a buzz. Like, did you guys know that so and so was on the prices right just last week on his way here or whatever? And I know that everybody was talking about it at the memorial. And yeah, I don't remember the Monday. memorial. We watched um, it on the Monday after the memorial, but yeah, you were there. I mean, they were there at your convention too. So that is unbelievable. Yeah, that was a fun convention. They had a big uh, green screen at the time. It was new because it was like 03 or, or something like that. Uh, and they allowed me to throw discs into it. And so that was the big hype. You know, all the, the bro nice. principals were just like, what is this? You know, so that was cool. And I could swing the golf club too. So that looked really good too. I could go both ways. <laughs> nice nice 
Well, Des, uh, we, we can't thank you enough for taking some time out of your schedule. You're such a busy, wonderful ambassador, true world-class elite player, and someone that everybody needs to know. And thank you for stopping by and, and chatting with us, especially for dredging up some of the stories from the past. Uh, thanks for indulging our our love of history and, and love of the game in this kind of respect. So you've been very gracious with your time tonight. Thank you. Well, I... I appreciate you guys having me on here and, and thanks for doing your uh, due diligence. You were great hosts. I've done a lot of podcasts and you, you knocked out on the park with finding some gems as a, <laughs> as a, as nice. an athlete and an interviewer. I appreciate the, the care that you took with me. Thanks. Always. Well, it's easy. You know, I mean, we've known you for a long time too, but it's also I'm nice. Not that gonna the Hill go Country... fast. I'm not going to go any faster. I'm still grandma D. You can yeah, pass no, me. That's, right. that's, an, that's another one too. That's another <laughs> great. We'll save that one for Rock Hill. Oh, no, I don't know. <laughs> it's a good thing, you know. It's really nice that the uh, Hill Country, uh, Hill Country Internet worked well for us tonight too. So, like, one of the things that's going to be fun is like when we all four get together, we're going to have to rewatch part of Jay's episode and check out some of the faces that he was frozen in because there's there's some poses, you know, that from that show last week. So. I'm actually happy. I didn't think it was still rolling. And Jay's like, they might still be rolling. I was doing some <laughs> not good stuff in the background. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. All well, right. Thank, well, thanks again, uh, Des. And the good luck at every event down the road. And we absolutely look forward to seeing you in October in um, Rock Hill. And um, until then, just keep smiling. Keep, keep spreading the light. Keep spreading the mint. And keep uh, twirling it like you do. I love it. Friends through flight, friends for life. Nice. There you go. You, baby. Peace. All right. Good to see you, D. You know it.